Welcome to the Independent Advisors Podcast, where we dive into the world of stocks, tradable markets, and financial planning with Jessup Wealth Management's Chief Investment Officer, Mark McEvely, and CEO, Matt Jessup. You'll hear tips, tricks, and strategies to address your financial well-being, and most importantly, conveyed in a way that everyone can understand. Here are your hosts, Mark and Matt. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 150 of the Independent Advisors Podcast, where Matt Jessup and I, Mark McEvely, bring you everything you need to know from the past week in the world of financial markets and financial planning. So good morning, Matt. Good morning, Mark. It's good to be back in the saddle again after not being in here last week, but I think Aaron did a good job filling in. He did a great job. So He did a great job. Um, he had good content. Yeah, he did. Um, so before we begin, as always, I uh, just want to take the first few minutes to recap the performance for the month and the year of the major indexes that we track. And these numbers are as of the market close on May 18th. And this data is from Coifin. S&P 500 index down 5.05% for the month and down 17.68% for the year. The Dow down 4.65% for the month and down 13.47% for the year. NASDAQ Composite Index down 2.84% for the month and down 23.4% for the year. The IWM ETF that tracks the Russell 2000 Index down 4.71% for the month and down 20.77% for the year. Vanguard International ETF uh, down 3. For 2% for the month and down 15.13% for the year. Three month T bill yielding 1.03%. Uh, so the first time we've seen that above one in quite some time. Two year Treasury yield at 2.66% and the 10 year Treasury yield at 2.88%. Um, obviously, I think everybody is aware of the big news and headlines and current events from the past week. Matt, not much has changed. Uh, stocks continue their downward slide. And more recently, a lot of the what we call mega cap names starting to break down after hanging in there year to date. So that's you know what we consider some of the generals like Apple and Microsoft and Google um, all have hung in there uh, up until the past couple of weeks here. Yeah, I think, you know, there's just been obviously, you know, let's call it redemptions, you know, whether it's through, you know, 401k plans, mutual funds, etc. And, you know, even if these managers like certain names, they got to come up with liquidity one way or another, mm -hmm. right? And it's going to pull that stuff down. Um, and again, we're not, you know, recommending for or against, you know, those types of names. But, you know, I think ultimately, you know, what a lot of people are thinking, what's next, right? What, what, what's the trajectory of the market? Would you like to kind of start with your thoughts and I can go next? Yeah, well, I think the thing that you've seen this week is that um, bonds have actually started uh, to do their job somewhat in stabilizing and, um, you know, not falling along with stocks. So, for example, yesterday was an extremely volatile day, you know, S&P down about 4%, and the 20-year Treasury bond was up greater than 2%. Um, so, you know, that's helpful because we haven't really seen that yet this year. And I know that it was that's only, a bold statement, it was only we, one day. It's been four and a half months. We haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So that's that's encouraging. Um, you know, I think Shanghai ports resuming uh, their normal capacity or 90 percent, I think, was the number that I read the other day uh, of being able to get product onto ships and have ships clear the ports um, is is beneficial. So Shanghai is beginning to reopen yep. right now. Yep. However, I don't, you know, just don't think those effects are going to be felt entirely for the next several months here in, in the U.S. Correct. So, you know, I would expect further market volatility. You know, we are in a uh, in a pretty obvious downtrend right now. And the, the definition of a, a downtrend is lower highs and lower lows. And that's what you're seeing if you pull, you know, any of these major indices up on a chart right now. So I know it's not a fun environment. Um, but you know, it's, it's part of the process that we go through these things from from time to time. Um, 2002, 2007, obviously larger than right now. But you know, this happened in, in 2015, 2016, um, mm -hmm. 2018, and then obviously during COVID. Um, but it is a different type of sell-off like it normally is than the previous few that we have had. Yeah. And, you know, I again, this is, your, this is my personal opinion. 
at the end of the day, I don't think this will be as bad as an 07 to an 09. And I have my reasons for that, and I'm happy to get into it. But, you know, ultimately, it, do I think it's going to get worse before it gets better? That's a yes for me, unfortunately. But I will also uh, be very direct and say that this is a very challenging market if someone is going to attempt to time it. What do I mean by that? This is not a market that I could advocate to someone to be like, go 100% to cash and then just get back in at a later date. Because we've seen some pretty violent moves to the downside. And at some point here, you're going to see some pretty violent moves to the upside. And you miss out on some of those by, by being completely out of the market. That, I think, is really going to mess with with your returns for the year. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to note also that um, the best days for the main market indices, they happen when the, the index is trading below its 200-day moving average. So... Um, for all intensive purposes, we can, you know, quote that as a downtrend. When markets are in downtrends, they have their best days ever. And there has been research done out there that if you missed, you know, the 10 best or 20 best days in the market, how that affects long term performance. And it's pretty severe, I think. Um, so, Jenna, next week, if you want to remind me to get some data on that for listeners, um, because I have read pieces on that before, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it is. But, you know, some of the best days do occur when we're in downtrends. Yeah. Now, it might not be long lasting, but it is what it is. Yeah. And I guess, I guess to kind of put a bow on, on, on this specific topic. One thing that I think I want people to kind of remember is doesn't mean you can't lower your risk footprint to a certain extent. But, um, you know, if you're generally in the market, stock specifically, you're not needing all that money in six months, nine Correct. months, 12 months, 18 months, right? And I think it is human nature to get psychologically involved with, oh my gosh, I have to take action right now. And even it's me saying, I think things are actually going to get worse before they get better. It invokes a reaction of, I need to do something. Mm -hmm. That needs to be balanced with your longer term views and goals on these assets. And I know what I'm saying is advice that is easier to say than it is to do it, right? It's a classic quandary of getting advice. And this is why in times like this, really good wealth advisors, wealth managers do uh, should or really earn their keep in providing that type of advice to their clients, knowing their goals and helping them navigate their level of risk that is appropriate. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good good point that I think you know, it gets lost in translation sometimes when we do experience this market volatility is that people forget that they don't need this money for several more years. And if you do, I mean, I've been banging the table on this podcast about this all the time, even though you're not earning anything on it, if you need money six months or nine months from now, you really shouldn't be investing it anyways. But people were so yield starved. And because the market has been up and up and up for the past 10 years. They're like, what should I do with this money that I'm going to need in four to six months? And I'm always like, you can invest it, but you're putting it at risk because you can go through a time that we're going through right now. And no one knows when that next downturn is going to be. So, you know, cash is a asset class for a reason. And it's if you need that in the very short term, you should have that set aside in cash, even though it's not necessarily yielding a lot. Right. Per perfectly said, Mark. And I guess just one more thing to add that I think is important for a lot of clients who are taking, say, systematic monthly withdrawals for living expenses. They have to realize that even in this type of environment, those types of clients aren't 100 percent in quote unquote stocks anyways. Mm -hmm. So there's areas of the portfolio that are easy to get that income from, whether it's the asset class of cash, the asset class of bonds or fixed income. 
And then what that does is it allows time to heal equity prices. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Hopefully, the roundtable we just had is insightful for our viewers and listeners. And um, I know at least some of the talking points I'm going to have, you know, I, I think in the in the weeks and months to come, uh, I pride ourselves, and I'll just say this with episode 150, I pride ourselves with the content, Mark, that you and I are putting out there for our viewers and listeners. And I think that we are, we cut through the noise and we're very direct on our feelings on the markets. Um, I'm not saying we're always going to be right, right? We're human. We're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, we have opinions. Uh, but I think it's we provide a good set of data points that they, it could at least be another thing they consider. Yeah, and that's what, you know, that's what, people need during times like this, right? That's why we started the podcast in the first place is to just be transparent and honest with people and let people know when times are good and when times are bad. And we talk through both of those periods, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, like you said, we're not always going to be right. If we were always going to be right, we would be on a beach somewhere. That's what I always tell my clients. I'm like, if I had that crystal ball, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. And I'd be sipping a margarita on a beach, but that's just not how the market works. Yeah. I view us as good fiduciaries. And right? if, if you think back to, you know, the best, in my opinion, the best fund manager in history, Jim Simons, Looking back at his track record and his performance, his performance has been head over heels greater than anybody else's, and his trades made money 51% of the time. So it was pretty much a coin flip for if this trade was going to make money or if it wasn't going to make money. So yeah. I think it's just important to remember that. No, I think it's great. N nice little reminder coming back to the 150 mark as to why you and I put all this time and effort into doing this. Yeah, it's all worth it. And we love talking about it. So oh, yeah. it makes it easy. Oh, yeah. So uh, moving on to tweets, articles, and research from the week. The first was a tweet by FactSet um, back on May 15th. And they said the forward 12-month P.E. ratio for the S&P 500 of 16.6 .6 is below the five-year average of 18.6 and below the 10-year average of 16.9. So we have seen you know, drastic uh, uh, pull-ins, I guess, of valuations or drastic decreases of valuations because I think that was the big thing for a lot of people is like, you know, valuations are crazy. All these stocks are, are way too expensive. And now we've almost had a reset in, in valuation. And I mean, just back in, oh God, I should have put my glasses on. And even for, for our for, listeners, for you listeners, gotta pull us up on YouTube once in a while. Yeah, we'll have so Jenna see, put so this can, up, and I so actually you can see our video. Uh, uh, Mr. McEvely was looking quite close. Yeah, at and his, I actually uh, I just got there. speaking of that, I just got glasses. Just got glasses. They're only for like when I'm at my computer and stuff. Um, and there's other reasons that I won't go into today, but it's funny because they look good on you. Very GQ. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I always used to make fun of my wife, Kenzie, because before she got LASIK a few months ago, she would have to wear glasses to watch TV or to look at certain things. And I always used to poke fun at her and call her four eyes. And <laughs> I guess that's what I get <laughs> for doing that. Yeah, ex exactly. So now she's, she's having her fun. Um, but even just, you know, a year or two ago, it looks like, you know, the average P.E. ratio for the S&P was around 23. So I think that that's a pretty a pretty safe reset. And again, for people that aren't very familiar with P.E. ratios, it's a valuation metric that a lot of people use to say, hey, is this stock overvalued or undervalued or is this index of stocks overvalued or undervalued relative to history, historical data points? Correct. Yeah. And the P stands for price over earnings, which is the E. So, you know, obviously the lower the E, the lower the denominator and the higher the numerator, which is the price. It's like, OK, that's going to be considered to be overvalued. But the lower the price and the higher the E, it's like, OK, that's undervalued. This company is generating a lot of earnings growth and the price has significantly come in. So maybe that's a good entry opportunity. So that's how it's historically viewed. And I know that me and you aren't very keen on PE ratios, especially looking back 12 months and not looking forward. Correct. But, you know, this is one of the concerns people have had over the past couple of years is that valuations have been high. Great segue for a comment I want to make. This morning, I was reading a couple of research notes. This one was from Argus, their head of research. This is what he said at the very bottom of his market outlook note. He sat there and said, 
this market has corrected. And why has the market corrected? Two main concerns is valuations have come down. So as interest rates have gone up, people are willing to pay less for earnings. But then he said this, I question in next quarter's earnings season, if you're really going to see a deterioration in earnings that these stocks are reflecting right now. Mm -hmm. And it's a very good point because stocks, in my opinion, stocks tend to lead their earnings, right? And so if you look at these stock charts, let's just say what's the S&P year to date, down 20? Let's call it down 20, mm -hmm. right? So let's say part of that is people pay, willing to pay less for earnings, but let's say that that's half of the picture. Are we trying to insinuate that corporate earnings on average are gonna drop by 10%? Well, I just listened to uh, Bill Danoff. He is the uh, largest active, uh, he runs the largestly active mutual fund called Fidelity Contra. And he was talking about you know the, the, the earnings estimates this year uh, for the S&P 500 index as a whole is about $225 and next year it's 250. That stuff's already been revised down. And so you're, you're, you're sitting there and saying that these prices are coming down, but underlying earnings, you would assume would be coming down too. And that might not necessarily be the case. Yeah. Something, yeah. So to, it'll be something to throw out there. Interesting to see how the earnings uh, reports play out here in the summer. Yeah. Uh, next was a tweet by Charlie Bellello on May 6th of this year. So... Uh, one of your favorites, Matt. He said CNBC ran its Markets in Turmoil special last night. They need to have you on for one of those things. And he said it was the it's the only indicator with a perfect track record. Say that again. The only indicator, indicator with a perfect track record. How many so, data sets? So this is all the way. 50? Yeah. Let's see. I should have come prepared with this. That's it's right. got to be Maybe almost 100 probably actually okay so every time that cnbc runs this markets in turmoil special the one year forward return on the s p 500 has been positive he says every single time and the average one year return is 40 <laughs> percent <laughs> so again i'm just i haven't confirmed this data but that's pretty pretty ridiculous if that's if that's actually true and you know we haven't had one there was no markets in turmoil in 2021 the last one was on june 4th of 2020 and from june 4th of 2020 to june 4th of 2021 s p 500 was up 37 percent yeah and i will say um now, now i'm gonna look at my um my computer closely Looks like the lowest one-year return was back on when it occurred on February 5th of 18. One year later, it was only up 4%. 4% yeah. So that was the lowest return that could have broke the data set, right? Looks like the other one was 9%. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, is this, is this mean that um, uh, the markets are going to be definitely positive since this last special on May 5th? No way. But... That's a pretty telling set of data, if mm -hmm. you ask me. Right. And going back to our, our conversation that we had earlier of, we have to step back and look at when people need to tap into this money in retirement. Do you need it within the next year? Do you need it within the next five years? There you right? go. There you go. Uh, last but not least, it was a tweet by Gordon Johnson that <laughs> kind of just made me laugh just the way he phrased it. So I can't wait to hear this one. He said... My God, the 30-year fixed mortgage rage just hit. He didn't say mortgage rate. He said mortgage Louis, rage. Louis, Louis liked that, by the way. Did you hear, did you hear him squeak there? Yeah. Just hit 5.64%, up 2.55% year over year with the average home price at 511000 now versus 408000 last year. The average cost of a mortgage is now twenty, a little more than 2700 Versus 1700 a year ago, up 60% year over year. Can you say housing crash in three, two, one? Thank you, Federal Reserve. 
So he um, seems a little peeved. Uh, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say yeah. that. But again, I, I'm still in the camp that we've been for the past several months is I don't think we're going to see a housing crash. I think you're definitely going to see a pullback now that interest rates are going up. Um, but I don't... And new builds are in a, uh, permits are at a 20-year high? Yeah, exactly. So again, define what you want crash to be, but I don't... I don't think it's going to crash. I think you're definitely going to see a slowdown, though. I yeah, mean, I especially mean, if, if we're if we're heading towards a recession, which seems pretty likely right now. Yeah. And again, uh, I'll say this again about real estate. I think it's going to be more prices are going to be more sensitive on the coast where they've seen uh, more appreciation than the Midwest, as an example. And I think the sensitivity is also going to be more apparent in vacation type markets, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's again. I would fully expect prices to, to start to come in over the next couple of months, but that doesn't necessarily mean housing prices are going to get cut in half. <laughs> no, right? yeah, exactly. I mean, so, underwriting requirements are still extremely strict. Yeah, very much. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right. First piece I got for the viewers and listeners is uh, some research from top-down charts. They always do some good raw research like, uh, like Bespoke does. They had a chart that caught my eye, Mark, and this will be in our show notes. I know Jenna will put it up for our viewers on YouTube. Uh, this chart shows the one year forward S&P 500 price returns subsequent to a five month decline in the S&P greater than 15 percent. OK, and so in essence, one year after the market declines more than 15 percent, in a short time period, in this example, in their data set, it's five months, the average return is 18.6%. I found that really interesting. And this data set goes all the way back for 65 years. Really, really interesting. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of if, ands, and buts about what's going on right now, right? You know, you got rising rates, you got supply chain issues. I mean, I can go down the list of the walls of worry, just an interesting data set that, you know, people, it, it's hard to look past next week. It's hard to look past the end of the second quarter right now. And this is just one of those pieces that pick your head up for a second and just look around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think, you know, something else that, that people don't realize is when we get, you know, pullbacks like this, even if it's, you know, a small pullback, if it's 10%, 20%, 30%, one year forward returns tend to move higher. Yes. Right. Yes. So again, viewing it through the lens of opportunity, if we're looking at a, at a long time horizon. Right? Correct. Next piece is another thing from uh, top down charts. It shows the estimated profit and loss of all retail flows. So retail flows starting from January 2020. The reason that this kind of caught my eye, Mark, is during COVID shutdowns, people develop new hobbies. And what's one of those new hobbies people started to have? Day trading. Day trading, right? <laughs> and so this chart shows that at one point in March of 21, the average gain of a retail investor from January of 2020 was over 40%. Fast forward to today, they're on average, they're break even right now, mm -hmm. going back. Not uncommon with where the market's at, right? But it just, it caught my eye because you could see people who are maybe, let's say, investing, you know, rent money or money that is not deemed to be long term investments that if they start to get in the loss column, mm -hmm. that could add to some of the selling pressure. Yeah, absolutely. There's something I want to throw out there as an observation. Yeah. Okay, that fair? Yeah. Okay. So next, and my final topic of the week is my silver lining of things could be a lot worse. Mm -hmm. So um, another chart that I got, top-down charts, um, topic of this chart, and now Jenna will put it up for our YouTube viewers. It'll be in our show notes. Quote, will there be more blood? The 2020 bear market in historical perspective. And what it does is it puts into perspective other brutal, brutal corrections in the market. 
1937, 07 and 09, 73, 74, 2000 to 02, 29 to 32. And it kind of shows like where we're at. Now, do I think things are going to get really as bad as these other data sets? No. But once again, it wouldn't surprise me if we go lower before bottoming. A lot of mega cap stocks have strong balance sheets in comparison to the two most recent data sets of 07 and 2000, which will help them find a bottom sooner rather than later, in my opinion. But I think people need to be looking at this through the lens of patience. And since we've been doing this podcast, there have been a couple instances where I'll just say it directly. You and I were, uh, I would say, more bullish than most people calling for more V-shaped type recoveries. Um, you know, people thought we were crazy. I'd spike the football very professionally. Um, and this is one of those instances. Did I just do it, did I just do it right there? <laughs> <laughs> but this is an instance where I think, um, you know, there's some structural issues. And you've identified that in this podcast. I've done it to a certain extent myself, Mark. And, you know, um, we, we can't control the markets. What we can do is take our experience um, in the way that we do things and convey that in, in this podcast. And I think that um, this is, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope someone spikes the football in my face and we have a V-shaped recovery and anything's possible. I just think the statistical chances with all the data sets I'm seeing is, that's not a likely thing. Yeah, absolutely. Is that and fair? I, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's tough to think about now, but these type of events tend to breed uh, very long term opportunity in the markets. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's underappreciated. You should it, focus on that in the next podcast. And it, yeah, and it tends to breed innovation. So current companies coming up with new technology or, or a new product or a new service and private companies that eventually in the next couple of years that go public that, you know, create game changing products and services for people. So th these are the times that that stuff is kind of born. Um, so it's not all bad. I know right now it seems like it's all bad. Um, but this, this stuff, uh, does tend to develop opportunities, uh, with current publicly traded companies and also companies that have not yet gone public, but, um, just trying to look at the glass half full here. The other last thing I'll just say is, you know, someone asked me, Hey Matt, do you think that we're going to see systematic layoffs like we've seen in 07 and 09. I was, I've been asked that question. And again, my opinion, my opinion is I don't think you're going to see anywhere near the magnitude of systematic layoffs in all industries like in 07 and 09. One thing that's going to buoy that is the fact that we still have over 10 million job openings, right? And you, you've, you've noticed this before. And so um, with that being said, could a lot of these job openings dry up as the year goes on? Of course. But do uh, and could layoffs happen? Absolutely. But not to the broad systematic way that it was in 07 and 09. Again, giving some people some silver linings. Yeah. OK. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so uh, Taylor is out sick today and she had the financial planning topic of the week. So we are going to skip over that for this week. We'll let her do it next time. Yep. We will be back uh, with everybody next week for episode number 151. But until then, have a great weekend. Get outside. Get away from the screens. Uh, enjoy the warm weather that I think it's going to be in most parts of the country. So hang in there, everyone. It'll get better over time. Yep. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Independent Advisors podcast. If you're interested in hearing more, hit the subscribe button so you can be notified every time a new episode gets released. Feel free to share with friends, family, and follow us on Twitter at Jessup Wealth, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mark and Matt will continue to share beneficial information on these social media sites. Also, check out the podcast tab on their website. That's www.jessupwealthmanagement.com. There you'll find links to every episode of the Independent Advisors. Have questions or topics you want to discuss on the show? Message us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or send an email with the words questions and topics in the subject line to inquiries at jessupwealthmanagement.com. We'll talk about it right here on the podcast. Certain sections of this commentary may contain forward-looking statements based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. All indices are unmanaged and are not available for direct investment by the public. 
past performance is not indicative of future results. This podcast is provided for general informational purposes only and does not constitute either tax, legal, or financial advice. Although we do go to great lengths to make sure our information is accurate and useful, we recommend you consult a tax preparer, professional tax advisor, financial advisor, or lawyer regarding your specific circumstances. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. No strategy can guarantee any objective or goal will be achieved. Advisory services offered through Commonwealth Financial Network, a registered investment advisor.